Okay, so our next speaker uh, that I'd like to welcome to the stage is uh, Fred Frederick Schuler. Uh, so Fred calls himself an unemployable nomadic peasant scholar who, having learned as an undergraduate the lesson that ecology is the science of where organisms are found, has spent half a century finding and documenting where organisms occur. Today he's here to pitch his thoughts that if ecological and natural history events are to be properly represented in popular media, naturalists and scientists must write articles and get them published. So uh, Fred, I see you're on the screen. Um, I'll let you take it away. All right. Yeah. And I just want to say that that back when I was was younger, there was the notion that continental plant communities were so tightly integrated that invasive species weren't possible and that um, and that the, the natural advanced communities were so integrated that invasives didn't happen. And, and so, so the idea, I, I mean, this is sort of a falsified hypothesis, obviously, um, but, but there are these big changes in the way people think about things. And so I'll try to share my screen. Let me know when you need me to change slides. All right, so I'll start. Um, yeah, so, so news is, is so anthropocentric and if we go to the next slide, so so this is this is just diagnostic. When, when we ran the Eastern Ontario Biodiversity Museum, we were cautioned with that line that some people don't know that plants are alive, and and this is a a friend of ours who who was talking about these spruce trees to a friend of his who was a lawyer. And the lawyer didn't know that there was more than one kind of evergreen tree. And, and you can't fret about invasive species, whether Norway spruce are invasive, if the person you're talking to doesn't know there's more than one kind of tree. So we'll have the next slide. And so the medium that we've been using recently, uh, the newspaper, the North Grenville Times, and and in the top there, you see the Queen Charlotte Islands Observer, which was um, where we had quite a discussion with the local um, local law in the late 1980s. Uh, so a newspaper that was founded by somebody who was a professor and decided to write write a newspaper and David Shanahan runs the North Greenville Times and he's a, a historian of um, of Canada with an emphasis on the indigenous people so the next slide so so these these um, slides have links to the um, to I'll, I'll put those up on our doing our quiet curatorial time blog but i've also put the link to all of them in the chat so so with reed canary grass this is a a little pond we have on our land that was just taken over by it and 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 the the theme of this article was that you can have invasives that aren't conspicuous if you're not recognizing species of grasses and most people don't recognize species of grass and and how difficult it can be when there's a native relative and and i said how the opic's best management plan for reed canary grass is really desperate you know it suggests all kinds of things but not very well so next slide And, and I, I talked about, you know, all these other stories about how there's hidden reptile um, aliens living among us and controlling things and how we always used to think that the narrow leaf cattail live and it just happened to be expanding across the, the southern prairies um, through the 1930s and the 1970s. And and then it turns out when people did some more work that it was it was a European species, 
And and we when we went across the prairies in 2014, 2015, we sort of counted up all the states. And and more than 70% of them were um, were narrow leafed, and that made the the broadleaf uh, species at risk because it was less than 30% of the total area it would have occupied previously. The next slide. And here's here's a picture um, from a, a little poster I made about how. Um, Buckthorn whackers had three times the aerobic capacity of of citizens who didn't fret about invasive species, and you know we just got buckthorn everywhere, and uh, you, there's all different ways of controlling it. But you're all familiar with buckthorn, so we'll go to the next slide. And and this is one of my personal campaigns is is the uh, the parsnip webworm which eats up all the seeds on a lot of parsnip plants control methods for parsnip just cut the plants down herbicide the plants or cut them down and since the the parsnip webworms are univoltine um, all the methods wipe out the webworms and we're setting up some places on our land just to see to what extent the webworms can actually control parsnip and and thin it out to be scattered plants rather than solid solid stands next slide yeah and garlic mustard i've often thought that if if garlic mustard could become sort of the national food of Toronto, that it would be a lot less extensive. And um, this, this is a, from a stand that we have on our land. We always a year, we because we go places and seeds would come back on our, our boots or something. But then the neighbors put in a, a septic tank mound and made a mound with was just loaded with garlic mustard seeds and it's it's just everywhere is now and even if we eat vast amounts of it and pull vast amounts of it um we're still struggling against it but um you know over exploitation is things and if everybody in toronto felt they had to get a good meal of garlic mustard every spring there might be a lot less of it there the next um slide and, and here's here's the little Taraxacum palustri, um, which of course all all our dental, at least aliens, even if not invasive aliens, and and we have just recently this second species, um, which lives in the soggier parts of the the old fields and along roads, and it's the first flower to come out in spring and. This was an article encouraging people to recognize them and and to know what they were like. Next slide. And and here we have Sardia paposa, which you know was native to sort of the of the states and um, north into Alberta and east the way to New England, in in Ontario wonderfully restricted to the margin of the four lane roads and um and, and this this article was gave some results of some work i did planting it on the two lane road at our place and it's gradually the stand has gradually shrunk away really take it unless there's something about the 400 series roads that sustains it next slide and and birds what i think there really has been either either low growing forms of the species have spread out of pastures or some other habitat were being low um, was beneficial and it just really seems to be a lot more extensive 
on lawns than it used to be. And the same thing, Helol also has evolved these low growing forms. And, and one of the important things we have to conservationists is that, that species evolve to, to fit um, change conditions. And this is a very spectacular bright yellow um, change in the way the species lives. Next, next slide. And, and here's, here's uh, Petocytes japonicus um, with a population that was along the Rideau Canal, and which, which Parks Canada, when they rebuilt the bridge that it was growing around, actually went after them and, and eliminated it. So it was a, a case of real action, eliminating a population of invasive species, which you don't often see. Um, this, and I'm not sure whether I wrote to, I can't find an email where I wrote to Parks Canada and told them about it or whether they actually observed it on their own, but they did take it all out. Next slide. And, and of course, <laughs> we've always got Phragmites. Um, this is me standing in the stand where I, Every year, I measure the tallest stem just to see how um, to see how the weather influences how tall it is. Uh, and we go to the, the next, next slide. slide. And and here I am in a native stand out near Ignace, and and I think we've really got to encourage the native Phragmites and and establish the. Um, you know, the fact that they are different and, and even though they're called subspecies, there's so few hybrid populations, so few hybrid stands have been found that, you know, if they were animals, they would be called species, but botanists have a different notion of what a subspecies is. And, and we really ought to encourage um, propagation of the natives and, and, and even exploit the, the stems that they have as a decorative uh, grass in soggy places. Next slide. And, and this is quotes from, um, from an article that, that the Times ran about when the invasive species was passed and where I expound what I call my theorem of the stupid worker and that the, the, the management assumes that the people who are doing vegetation control aren't going to be able to learn to distinguish the species that ought to be preserved from the species that ought to be uh, controlled. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's insulting to assume that people aren't going to be able to learn the difference between species. They just need to be taught. And um, certainly a lot of the that the Plant Council has been doing has, has increased knowledge of that kind of thing. And, and, and if we're going to have rapid detection and rapid response, we've really got to have widespread um, networks of people that can identify and then real government action to, uh, to do the controls. Next slide. So this is, this is a, a th I, after I'd sort of done this, uh, there was this ideas program about metaphors for, cl for climate change. And here's a metaphor for climate change um, from a, an ice cream company that, that says, you know, two degrees warmer can really melt your ice cream and two degrees warmer would really melt the earth. And and I encourage everybody to listen to that ideas program to just think about it in present arguments against invasive species. And next slide. Right. And, and so these are the, um, the kinds of metaphors that are used for climate change, just providing information um, caring versus 
being uh, harmful, poverty versus corruption, um, illness or meltdown, um, to have a war against climate change or a covert war already underway against us and the, Im the direct impacts on individuals and, and love of the existing people and, and ecosystems. And we can see how each of these can be used for invasive species in parallel ways. And we get into that in the next slide. So, so one of the things I love species is that you have to love your enemies and you have to know what the reasons are that some species are invasive and other species aren't. And, and this is, this is a painting of um, Salix fragilis, which, which has sort of taken over the big willow tree niche in southern Ontario. And, and you very many of the native black willows that look just like these, um, these Salix fragilis. Um, so, so you have to, you have to sort of be with the plants and you have to understand why they're there and what their, their strengths are. Next slide. And, and, and I think if people are going to really be concerned about non-native species, they have to know how the native species came to um, came to be where they are and how abundant they are, and, um, and 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 sort of understand holistically what the landscape is like, uh, and and what its history is, and and why, if we're living in a place, we should. Um, we should appreciate the native fauna, or fauna and flora, as as being an integrated um, system. Next slide. And and we always have to remember that there are no completely wild places in Canada, and that um, around locally around here on the where the Champlain Sea was, we've got archeological remains right on the, the shores of the Champlain Sea. So, so people have been modifying the vegetation for as long as it's been. And, and it, it, it's really different. Um, you go down into the Appalachians and they've got just lots and lots of species. And, and you go down to the Ozarks and they have streams that have been there since the the, Pale the Paleolithic, the, oh, anyway, the Mesozoic, and but but everything we have is new, and and it's all been influenced by the people. And if we classic example is that if you stop the the burns through forests that indigenous people did, you get build up of much more completely. Next slide. And, and we have to think about the European species, roadside species, um, that, that they have so much more evolutionary experience um, with an agricultural subtle landscape than our native species do. And, and, and native species Facebook pages where where people say, what should I use for a ground cover? <laughs> and, you know, they just, agriculture was so much more spaced out and, and, and short term around in here before European settlement that we just didn't evolve the species that can handle roadsides and trampling and, and field, you know, um, agricultural fields. So we have to, you know, understand that that's where most of the conspicuous plants we have around our settlements came from. Next slide. And, and this is totally illegible and a version of it on the, the final version of the presentation. But we also have to think about, um, uh, in this case, the 
the um, the sumac and and the goldenrod that we the species that are sort of aggressive natives here are often invasive aliens when they get over to Europe um, and and we have to remember that it's like you know one of the worst things Stalin did for Russia was to introduce muskrats and he probably would have introduced uh, sumac and and goldenrod if he'd known about them. Next slide. And and here's here's a, a thanks for all the people that have helped. Um, but this is a painting Alita did of a uh, a site where they were proposing to put a um, a landfill in, and um, and they did an environmental assessment, but they didn't mention any of the invasive species that were already present or how those might spread change in various ways in um, in the change conditions in a landfill and we one of the things that Lady and I do is we get asked to evaluate environmental assessments that various habitat destruction projects were are um, are uh, you know have produced and one thing that um, the plant council can can work on is trying to get invasive plants into environmental assessments because they're they're just very much neglected 